And now it is time to welcome our first guest in a segment we call Dog Mom Biz. Few people on the planet have more knowledge and experience in the realm of high-end purebred dogs than Laura Reeves. Laura is an AKC breeder of merit, AKC judge, and the host of the Pure Dog Talk podcast. She is a retired member of the Professional Handlers Association under the Scotia Kennel banner. Her podcast just celebrated its, listen to this, sixth 100th episode, hashtag goals. And she joins us now from Grants Pass, Oregon. Laura, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Karina. I sure appreciate it. That is such an intro. You have such incredible experience and I can't wait to unpack it all with you. But we want to start in the beginning, Laura. Where did your love for dogs come from? I have had dogs my whole life. Um, I grew up with dogs. I my parents had dogs. We had all kinds of dogs. And when I was a kid, my I was sort of shy and retiring and lacked people skills. That was my mother's definition. And so she enrolled me in Dog Care 4-H. And clearly, it worked out okay for me. <laughs> Obviously, you know, and hey, we're all in process, right? And those experiences have made you who you are today. So I love that. And dogs change all of us for the better, right? Yeah. I mean, that is just the bottom line. Now, you said you've, you've spent pretty much a lifetime working with, talking about dogs, and then judging purebred dogs. So how were you first introduced into the world of purebred dogs? So when I was a child growing up, we had horses, and my father got sick of hauling hay and building fence, basically. And he said, if you'll just get rid of these horses, I will buy you any purebred dog you want. And so I got my first English setter. My mom got a clumber spaniel. My dad had had field trial labs. So we just were basically surrounded by dogs. <laughs> wow. Now you had an English setter and I had an Irish setter. So how are they different? <laughs> um, well, the differences are in color are automatic, right? So the yeah, Irish setter is yeah. always red. The English right. setter can be many colors of spotted on white. Um, my English setter was lovely, but she, <sighs> English setters are really good at beautiful. They're not always as smart as some of the other dogs that I have been involved with. So. That's honest. And I love it. And that was the same thing about Sean too. I mean, he was a happy dog, just not the smartest dog. That's okay. But we love him. Like, she ate slugs. I mean, come on. Oh my. Yeah. That's next level, isn't it? That's okay. We love him anyway. Now I'm amazed by this. You spent 25 years as a professional dog handler. Um, I want to know just kind of some of the ins and outs of presenting and then handling dogs at such a high level. Right. So you drive a lot. Basically I put 50 or 60,000 miles a year on my vehicles, driving from dog show to dog show all around the country. And I personally would carry what we think of as a pretty light load. I'd only have 10 or 12 dogs at a time. And usually oh, I'd God. have a helper, like a teenage kid that helped me. Um, and we would go from point A to point B and break down and set up. It's almost like, it's almost like a circus. I mean, if you think of it, Sounds that like it. Mm -hmm. it would be a circus with me. I would just need you to tag along to make it very calm and cool and collected. <laughs> that is amazing. Now, um, you typically set up under the American Kennel Club, right? Right. So I show dogs, I breed dogs under the, working with the American Kennel Club, under the auspices of the American Kennel Club. AKC is what's considered a club of clubs. Okay. Yes. So I am not a member of the AKC, but the clubs that I belong to are. So that's the way that works. Now, I, I know that you've also had opportunities to sit on the other side of the table and actually judge dog shows. And we've all seen the dog shows on TV, but can you explain for our audience exactly what the judge is doing when inspecting and also watching the dogs? Absolutely. I just, just got back from judging the national specialty show for my breed, German Wirehead Pointers. So that was a really great, great, exciting opportunity 
but basically the judge is looking at the dogs, touching the dogs, feeling the dogs, looking at the dog structure, their conformation, their movement, and how it meets the standard of the breed. Each one of our 200 and some odd registered breeds with the American Kennel Club has a specific written standard. So it's not just, you know, who's the prettiest or who's the flashiest. It is literally which dog most closely meets the written standard. Okay. I'm amazed at the depth of knowledge that you have to have to do this. Have you ever had a moment where it was hard for you to make a decision? I mean, obviously the dogs are all incredibly beautiful. Everybody's really cute, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah. you have to make hard calls, right? Which one's more important, which, which feature, which quality, which we like to think that we judge on a positive basis, right? So which part of what makes a wire hair pointer a wire hair pointer is more important than the other part. And so those kind of fine lines, it's um, it can be a challenge for sure. I'm sure. And you just look at how trainers and handlers put their heart and soul into all of this. And I'm just amazed every time I watch these dog shows at the level of, of caliber and professionalism and how everything comes together. That is so neat how you've been able to be on both sides. It is, it is a journey. And I, you were talking about the um, professionalism and the, and the amount of time it takes. I am good friends with a, another judge who is also um, a PhD and he will tell anybody that will listen, right? That it took him longer and cost him more to earn his all breed judging license than it did to get his PhD. Wow perspective. Right. <laughs> there you go. Right. What a commitment. I love right. that. Okay. So you go 25 years as a professional dog handler about that. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at some of the world's most prestigious dog shows. You have such depth in your experience. What made you want to apply all of that to the podcasting world? Well, honestly, it was that my, I was getting older. My body wasn't, it's a dog handling is also a very, very physical job. The driving, the running, the lifting, the bending, the, all the things. And my, many of us who show dogs professionally have body parts that wear out <laughs> sooner than, than authorized. So the podcast was an opportunity to do something, to give back, um, to provide an educational platform about topics that. I really felt very strongly about, and I thought it was an area that was just missing at that particular point in the world of purebred dogs. Did it come easy to you or was it challenging? Were you shy or? No, I, I did not. I, I met a, a gal at some dog shows and she and I started talking about different um, educational opportunities that we kind of were investigating. And she um, is a, a stunt coordinator in Hollywood and right. And so she, she's a little more, I don't know, what would you say technology forward than I am I'm kind of a Luddite yeah. in reality. And she's like, well, I want to do a podcast. And I'm like, what's the podcast? <laughs> I'd never heard of it. Literally never heard of a podcast. And she said, she told me what it was. Blah, blah, blah. She's like, and I want you to host it. And I'm like, oh no. Oh no. I couldn't do that. That was terrible. Well, Let me write your script, right? Because my background is journalism. <laughs> yes, exactly. There you go. So you're like, that comes easy. But it yeah. sounds like she was bold and tough and she pulled that out of you yeah. and helped you see where you had that talent and ability. And it has been a really um talk about grow. We're always, we're always progressing, we're always growing. This has definitely been a journey um, from I, I had done some work in the past before I was handling full time. I worked uh, freelance uh, marketing, advertising, public relations, community work, um, and I had written scripts for self guided audio driving tours for national parks and national forests. And I was working for one of the top audio design guys in the country, frankly. And he taught me how to write for the ear, which is very, very different than writing. Uh, for a newspaper, which is where I had started in journalism. And you write a lead, it's a real different thing, who, what, when, where, why, how, than engaging someone right in the audio environment. And so That's that true. background combined, and it just kind of is a serendipity thing, I think. <laughs> 
That's great. All things work together. And you see how all your experiences in life kind of build, right? Mm -hmm. And took yep. you in that direction. I love that yep. so much. And now look at the success of this podcast. This is incredible. Pure Dog Talk just celebrated its sixth hundredth episode, as we said, congratulations to you, first of all, for that achievement. That's a really big deal. It, it is a really big deal. And, and to be, to be honest, it is somewhat shocking. Um, podcasts, particularly independent podcasts like this, we're not talking, you know, NBC news and all the big famous ones, little indie podcasts like this generally don't make money. Um, that's not a thing. And, and less than 10% of the people who do it succeed. And, I, I am able to do that by good fortune and um, good grace. So there you go. And you can do spirit. I love that about you, your tenacity. Uh, you started this in 2016. So what were some of those hurdles or challenges that you had to overcome? Did I mention I'm a Luddite? So, <laughs> so trying to figure out, right? Like um, yeah. just the technology. Like I... Yeah. I could talk on the phone, I could type on the computer, mm -hmm. right? But right. figuring yes. out a WordPress site, figuring out audio that, I mean, I had just pushed the button on the on the recorder when I was working with my audio guy. I didn't do any of the rest of it, so. It's a blessing and a curse, you know, and what works one day might not work the next. <laughs> it's like you yeah. have to troubleshoot so often. We have lots of, we have lots of um, redundancies built into the system at this point, for sure. Wow. I mean, you've had so many downloads and listeners, what, something like 1.6 million downloads and more than 300,000. Yeah, we're, up, we're at about 300. And it goes up all the time, right? And there's new listeners come in all the time. I mean, that's the great thing about it. And so we're at about, I don't know, 330,000 unique listeners, which awesome. is um, an amazing number because it is more than the American Kennel Club has breeders of merit. That, what? yeah. That's that's a that huge, awesome. that's a huge stat, right? So that that's so pretty great. fun. So what do you attribute to the growth? What do you attribute to the popularity? As you said, this started as pretty much an indie thing. So how did you get traction and and become so successful? It is definitely an indie thing. And I think I routinely, regularly, weekly, sometimes daily, hear from listeners who have been listening since the beginning or have just started listening or what have you. And the uh, basic concept is that there is a lot of information that they can't get any other place or that costs money to get somewhere else or what have you. I, I am fortunate because I know a lot of people, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. I, I'm a who you know sure. kind of girl. And I, I was able to leverage relationships and knowledge and experience and all of that. And the superintendents, right? The people who uh, put the dog show information so that people can enter the dog show with their dogs, blah, blah, they were like the very first sponsor. And so there's a clickable link on each one of those places. So that was a really great opportunity. And it's just word of mouth, social media. It That's was great. information that people wanted. Yes. And you mentioned social media and I don't know about you, but I feel this way sometimes. So many people want to pretend to be the expert. You know, they don't really necessarily have the experience, but they have a passion, you know, and I can't fault them for wanting to do what they love. But here's what we know about you. You actually brought so much depth and experience to the table and people know and people see it. And I mean, just from your wide range of experiences, I mean, really, you would have a lot of topics to pull from, yes. right? Yes. So, I mean, how do you even go about deciding what to do and how much do you value that authenticity as you're even deciding who to have on your show? I'm really, really, really picky um, mm -hmm. about the guests that I bring on. I know this goes back to who you know. I know who's right. real and who's not. And yes. I only bring people who are legitimate experts in their areas. And we cover mm -hmm. topics from veterinary to breeding, to, you know, showing the dogs, to training, to grooming, to the different sports that you can do besides the dog show. Um, yes. Literally every piece of the spectrum of purebred dogs we cover or have covered or will cover at some point mm -hmm. over the course of time and that, you know, deciding what it's going to be, I get listeners send me ideas, 
you know, um, I social media, I see something, it's a hot topic, we talk about it, right? So yeah. it's, it's so it was such part of the instigation for why I wanted to do the, the education pieces, what you mentioned before, right? That yes. keyboard warriors, right? Um, sharing yeah. a lot of knowledge that isn't really knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. having a reliable place for people to go and providing serious, legitimate information that when you see that Facebook argument break out, you can just drop a link and say, hey guys, I can solve this for you, it's right here. There's a podcast oh, for that. <laughs> that's awesome, and, and people love it that they, they, they feel like you're credible, they know you're credible, but also you're not wasting their time, their effort and their energy. You know, you're putting um, your heart and soul into it and sharing that valuable information, which can't be beat. It's awesome. Is, is there an overarching theme, would you say, for your podcast? Or maybe what are some of the issues you're most passionate about? Um, you know, we do a lot of discussion about specific breeds. So we have Love the Breeds, often a month long um, group of different breeds that we're going to talk about rare breeds, maybe, or Northern breeds or hounds or, you know, whatever we're going to do. And then a um, lot of veterinarian topics. I have a phenomenal um, partnership with Dr. Marty Greer from the um, veterinary village in Lomero, Wisconsin. And she comes on once a month and the number of people who have quite literally called and said that we saved their life, their dog's life is shocking. Um, it is truly, truly shocking. And so that's amazing. Um, I just, government relations, talking about some of the um, issues within the industry in terms of whether it's breed specific le uh, legislation or it's um, breeding uh, legislation that's anti-breeding. It's a lot of stuff out there in the world that impacts ownership and the ability to create your new best friend. That's right, your best friend. That's the truth. And I don't know if it gets more rewarding, Laura, than hearing you saved my dog's life. Not I mean, that just sense. has to fill you up. My goodness, it makes all the hard work worth it, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. Okay, it really does. So it does. It's the best. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to do some pure dog talk with Laura Reeves right now. And I want to know, um, get ready here, Laura. I know you're a, you're a champ. So we're just going to lightning round. <laughs> yeah, lightning round. And then you can bring the answers. So we'll start with this. Uh, what are some of the benefits of investing in a purebred dog? Okay. Purebred dogs bring a couple things. Number one, they are living history. They are literally a four-legged conduit to our past and to our future. Every single purebred dog represents a very specific people and place and time. And the pedigree and, and, and the breeding that has continued over hundreds and perhaps thousands of years, you literally have living history in your house. The fact that it's okay. purebred means that it's predictable. It is yes. predictably the size, the shape, the color, the temperament, the coat, all of those things, because it is purebred, particularly if it's purebred and it's produced by a preservation or responsible breeder who's really dedicated to this, you can be sure that when you read about that dog in a book and you go to buy that dog, it's actually going to be that, right? And that's something that, you know, if that's important in your life, you can't find that any other way. Good points. Now, as a potential buyer, um, what are the some of the expectations that we should have uh, when choosing a responsible breeder? That's key. It is key. It is absolutely key. First thing up, these are not toasters. <laughs> you, you, you don't get to just pull it off the shelf and walk out of Walmart with it. Okay. No. That is that is the most important thing that I can really encourage. Um, if 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 you're working with a responsible preservation breeder, it's going to take a minute. I mean, let's just be realistic. We have one, maybe two litters a year, so you're going to wait for a second. Um, if you are anxious to have something right now, you might consider looking at purebred rescue. Every single one of the 200 breeds has a parent club 
a national specialty parent club. Each one of those clubs has rescue that works specifically with that breed. So if a baby puppy isn't really what you're looking for and or you really want to have a dog in your home right now, rescue is something to consider, specifically the purebred rescue. Um, you're going to want to look for a breeder that will guarantee health of their dogs, that will guarantee that the dog will always be able to come back to them for any reason at any time. I have taken dogs back at nine years old. Um, that is super, super important. We, <laughs> preservation purebred breeders, do not and have no interest in contributing to shelter numbers. Our dogs are wanted and they're always wanted with us. I love that dedication. Nine years. You will take a dog back after nine years. That is pretty incredible. I did my house. A good fit. You want to make sure that that dog is set and up for somebody's, a wonderful life too. Somebody's life changes. There's a death in the family, a job change. You know, life happens. And I, I am more, it is more important to me that that dog come back to me and I know that it is safe than anything else. There is no judgment with that. I get it. Life happens. So. That's right. I love that so much. You know, many of the people in our audience are familiar with the Christopher Guest movie, Best in Show. One of my favorites personally. Right. <laughs> but how close not. does the movie get to reality in your opinion? I'm telling you, I get asked this question <laughs> all the time. And I am going to tell you fact, it is legit. It is seriously oh, legit. Wow. Most of yes. the most of the um like supporting actors and the and the cast that was around, those were real dog people in Canada. And oh, actually wow. one of my clients, a funny story, one of one of my clients had called me up and said, Hey, come up, they're shooting a movie in Vancouver. Come up and and help me with this dog. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm too busy. I can't make it. <laughs> I lived in Washington at the time. It would have taken me like two hours. Oh, well, <laughs> I know, my goodness. So you could have been, you could have been in it or played yes, a part absolutely. of it. Lord, I, I, yeah, that. Absolutely. The um, dog that was from the breeder that, that I work for um, is, you can see it in the movie. I'm like, that could have been me. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's just really, honestly, one of the best. And I can't tell you yes. how happy it makes me to hear you say it's pretty accurate in your opinion it, too. I mean, it's, I've laughed until I've cried. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is an exaggeration, right? But the type, yes, yes. typecast, right? Yes, I know every yes. single one of those people at some level. <laughs> Do you relate most to any of the characters? Um, you know, they all make sense to me. I just, yeah. I love, right. um, I can never remember his name, but the guy with the comes with the bloodhound, that's kind of my guy. <laughs> dirt, dirt, dirt. So great. And then the commentators too. Oh, well, look at yeah. him going after that like a piece of ham. You know, it's like what? Yeah. The ones, the one, okay. the one that I have mostly had as my clients is the one with the Weimaraner and the Busy Bee. I, oh, I can't yeah. tell you how many of my clients are those people. Oh my God. Would you apologize to the dog, please? It's like I once awesome. FaceTimed an owner in Mexico so that she could talk to her dog. That is not a joke. Oh, <laughs> Laura. That is God's awesome. on the tree. <laughs> and so for you dog moms who haven't seen this movie, you're welcome. You yes. need to go and see you it. Must Listen, see it. Listen to Karina. You have must to. See it. And if all oh. else fails, FaceTime your dog. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's right. You'll never go wrong. You'll never regret it. <laughs> it's awesome. Laura, thanks for being a trooper. Thanks for sharing your time and your experience. And your expertise. It's been such a joy to spend this time with you. Um, how can our audience keep informed of, of what's going on with you? What's the best way um, for them? The best to way to do it is go on anywhere that you get your podcast from iTunes on down the list. Go to Pure Dog Talk. Click follow the show. You'll be able to get all the episodes as they drop every Monday. You can also visit the website. We've got albums for the archives. You can keyword search by topic. And puredogtalk.com will keep you up to date on everything that's going on. All right. We'll make it a point. Laura Reeves, thank you so much. You take care. Thanks, Karina.